Chapter One of the British Army from Within. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The British Army from Within by E. Charles Vivian. Chapter One. Ubique. The Army as a Whole. On the badges of the Corps of Engineers, and also on those of the Royal Artillery, will be found the word ubique, but it is a word that might just as well be used with regard to the whole of the British Army, which serves everywhere, does everything, undergoes every kind of climate, and gains contact with every class of people. In this respect, the British soldier enjoys a distinct advantage over the soldiers of Continental Armies. He has a chance of seeing the world. India, Africa, Egypt, the West Indies, Mauritius, and the Mediterranean stations are open to him, and by the time he leaves the service he has at least had the opportunity of becoming cosmopolitan in his tastes and ways, of becoming a man of larger ideas and better grasp on the problems of life than were his at the time when he took the oath and passed the doctor. Of that phase, more anon. It is of little use in the present state of the British Army to attempt to define its extent or composition, for it is in such a state of flux that the numbers of battalions, regiments, and batteries of a year ago are as obsolete as the Snyder rifle. There used to be 157 battalions of infantry, 31 regiments of cavalry, and about 180 batteries of horse and field artillery, together with about 100 companies and 9 mountain batteries of royal garrison artillery, forming the principal strength of the British Army. To these must be added the Royal Engineers, the Army Service Corps, the Royal Ordnance Department, the Royal Army Medical Corps, the Army Pay Corps, and other non-combatant units necessary to the domestic and general internal working of an army. Today these various forces are increased to such an extent that no man outside the War Office can tell the strength of infantry, cavalry, and artillery. No man, either, can tell what will be the permanent strength of the army on a peace footing when the present urgent need for men no longer exists, and there is only to be considered the maintenance of a force sufficient for the garrisoning of colonial and foreign stations and for ordinary defensive needs at home. Generally speaking, the soldier at home, no matter to what arm or branch of the service he belongs, undergoes a continuous training. It takes three years to make an infantryman fully efficient, five years to make a cavalryman thoroughly conversant with his many duties, and five years or more to teach a gunner his business. The raw material from which the army is recruited is mixed and sometimes uneducated stuff, and in addition to this, recruits are enlisted at an age when they must be taught everything. They are past the age of the schoolboy who absorbs tuition readily and with little trouble to his instructors, and they have not attained to such an age as will permit them to take their work really seriously. This, of course, does not apply to a time of great national emergency when the men coming to the colors are actuated by the highest possible motives, eager to fit themselves for the work in hand, and bent for getting fit for active service in the shortest possible time. In times of peace, recruits join the colors from many motives. Pure patriotism is not a common one, and in consequence the hard realities of soldiering in peacetime disillusion them to such an extent that they are difficult to teach, and thus need the full term of training for full efficiency. Half the work of their instructors consists in getting them into the proper frame of mind and giving them that esprit de corps which is essential to the war fitness of a voluntary army. At the best, there is much in the work that a soldier is called on to do which is beyond his understanding in the first years of his service. One consequence of this is that he learns to do things without questioning their meaning, and thus acquires a habit of obeying. This, up to a few years ago, was the object of military training, to instill into the soldier unquestioning obedience to orders, and the sentence, obedience is the first duty of the soldier, gained currency and labeled the soldier as a mere cog in a great machine, one whose duty lay in obeying as did that Roman sentinel at Pompeii. 
One of the chief lessons of the South African War, however, was that such obedience was no longer the first duty of the soldier. He must obey, no less than before, but scientific warfare demands an understanding obedience and not the unquestioning die-at-his-post fidelity of old time. The recruit of today must be taught not only to obey, but to understand, and by that fact the work of his instructors, and his own work as well, are largely increased. Obedience was the watchword of yesterday. Obedience and initiative is the phrase of today. To come down to concrete facts as regards the actual composition and general duties of the Army, the main station in England is Aldershot, headquarters of the First Army Corps. Theoretically, in all cases of national emergency, the Aldershot Command is first to move, and the units composing it are expected to be able to mobilize for active service at 24 hours' notice. Next in importance are Colchester, Shorncliffe, York, and Bulford, the center of the Salisbury Plain area under military control. In Ireland, the principal stations are Dublin and the Curra. In these stations, under normal circumstances, the furlough season begins at Christmas time and lasts up to the following March. For this period, men are granted leave in batches and drill and training for those who remain in barracks while the others take their holidays is somewhat relaxed. Serious training begins in March when the corporals, sergeants, and troop and section officers begin to lick their squads, sections, and troops into shape. Following on this comes company training for the infantry, squadron training for the cavalry, and battery training for the artillery, and this in turn is followed by battalion training for infantry, regimental training for cavalry, and brigade training for artillery. Somewhere during the period taken up before the beginning of regimental and battalion training, musketry has to be fitted in, and as the ranges cannot accommodate all the men at once, this has to be done by squadrons and companies, while those not engaged in perfecting their shooting continue with their other training. At the conclusion of the training of units, regiments, battalions, and brigades of artillery, Brigade and divisional training is begun, and then maneuvers follow in which the troops are given opportunities of learning the working of an army corps, as well as getting practical experience of camp life under conditions as near those obtaining on active service as circumstances will admit. By the time all this has been completed, the furlough season starts again, and the round begins once more with a few more recruits to train, a few old soldiers missing from the ranks. In addition to the regular course of training that lasts through the year and goes on from year to year, there are various courses to be undergone in order to keep the departmental staff of each unit up to strength. Thus, in the infantry, signalers must be specially trained, and pioneers, who do all the sanitary work of their units, must be taught their duties, while musketry instructors and drill instructors have to be selected and taught their duties. Each unit, except as regards medical service and a few things totally out of its range of activity, is self-contained and self-supporting, and thus it is necessary that it should train its own instructors and its own special men for special work, together with understudies to take their places in case of casualties. The cavalry trains its own signalers, scouts, shoeing smiths, cooks, pioneers, and to a certain extent medical orderlies. The artillery does likewise, and in addition keeps up a staff of artificers to attend to minor needs of the guns, men capable of repairing breakages in the field as far as this is possible. Wherever horses are concerned, too, saddlers must be trained to keep leather work in repair. The engineers, a body of men who seldom get the recognition their work deserves, have to train in telegraphy, bridge building, construction, and demolition of all things, from a regular defensive fortification to a field kitchen, and many other things incidental to the smooth working of an army in the field. Departmental corps, such as the Army Service, Army Ordnance, and the Royal Army Medical Corps, not only train, but exercise their functions in a practical way, for in peacetime an army must be fed, equipped, and doctored, just the same as in war, except that in the latter case its requirements are more strenuous. 
the ancient belief entertained by civilians to the effect that the army is a profession of laziness is thoroughly exploded as soon as one passes through the barrack gates for the army as a whole works as hard as if not harder than the average man in equivalent stations of civilian life in foreign and colonial stations the work goes on just the same as far as limitations of climate will permit in plain stations in india the heat of the summer months renders training during the day impossible and men get their work over for the most part in the very early morning or in the cool of the evening malta and gibraltar are subject to the same limitations in a lesser degree as is south africa while mauritius and minor colonial stations have their own ways but no matter where the unit concerned may be it works fitness is dependent on work and no unit is allowed to get rusty while the variety of work involved prevents men from getting stale at the same time there is plenty of relaxation and sport as well as work in the routine of military life set a battalion down in a new station and the chances are ten to one that on the evening of their arrival the men will be kicking a football about each company and squadron and each battery of artillery as well has its own sports fund and sports club which keeps going the national games in the unit concerned men work hard and play hard and their play is made to help their work infantry units organize cross-country races which help enormously in maintaining the men in fit marching condition cavalry units get up scouting competitions and other sporting fixtures based on work to say nothing of tent pegging lemon cutting and other forms of military sport of which the royal military tournament annually affords examples while shooting ranges form fields for weekly competitions at such times as they are not in use for annual musketry courses the actual composition of the various units composing the british army differs from that of continental armies the only units of strength which are identical being those of the army corps and the division which is half an army corps the next unit in the scale is the brigade which is composed of three batteries of field or two of horse artillery three regiments of cavalry or four battalions of infantry a division is made up of brigades which vary in number and composition according to the work which that particular division will be expected to accomplish there is a standard for the composition of the division but changes now in process of taking place in the composition of the whole army render it unsafe to quote any standard as definite a normal division certainly is composed of cavalry artillery and infantry in certain strengths together with non-combatants and supply units making up its total strength to anywhere between twenty thousand and thirty thousand men the unit of strength in which figures become definite is the brigade of artillery the regiment of cavalry and the battalion of infantry the peace strength of each of these units may be regarded as a rule from ten to twenty per cent over the war strength and the war strength is as follows for cavalry a regiment consists of about six hundred and twenty officers and men of all ranks this body is divided into three service squadrons each of an approximate strength of a hundred and sixty officers non-commissioned officers and men the remainder of the strength of the unit forming the reserve squadron devoted to the headquarters staff the commanding officer and administrative staff of the regiment as well as the pom-pom or one pounder quick firer of which one is included in the establishment of every cavalry regiment in this connection it is probable that the experiences of the present european war will lead to the adoption of a greater number of these quick firers and in future each cavalry regiment will probably have at least two pom-poms as part of its regular equipment the possession of these of course involves the training of a gun crew for each weapon a full complement of gunners and drivers for artillery a brigade is divided into three batteries each of an approximate strength of a hundred and fifty men and six guns the artillery battery corresponds to the cavalry squadron and to the infantry company and in addition one ammunition column together with transport and auxiliary staff making up a total of about six hundred officers non-commissioned officers and men 
This refers to the field artillery, which forms the bulk of the British artillery strength and is armed with 18.5 pounder quick firing guns. The Royal Horse Artillery is armed with a lighter gun and is used mainly as support to cavalry in single batteries. It is so constituted as to be more mobile and capable of rendering quicker service than the RFA. Horse artillery is hardly ever constituted into brigades, as is the field artillery. Horse artillery, again, has no counterpart in the armies of continental nations so far as mobility and quality of armaments are in question. Infantry reckons its numbers by battalions, of which the war strength is approximately 1,010 officers and non-commissioned officers and men per battalion. Each battalion is divided into four double companies, the double company system having been adopted in order to compensate for a certain shortage of officers. The double company may be reckoned at 240 officers, non-commissioned officers, and men, roughly, and the remainder of the total is taken up by two Maxim gun sections and the headquarters staff of the unit. As in the case of the cavalry pom-pom, it is more than likely that the number of maxims or machine guns per battalion will be increased as a result of the experiences gained in the present Continental War. Engineers and departmental units are divided into companies of varying strength according to the part they are called on to play when the division is constituted. Thus it is self-evident that an average division will require more engineers who do all the field work of construction and demolition than it will army ordnance men who attend to the equipment of the division, fitting out with clothing, provision of transport vehicles, etc. The number of men of departmental corps allotted to each division in the field varies with the strength of the division and with its distance from its base of supplies. There is a permanent and outstanding difference between the British Army as a whole and any Continental Army as a whole. In the case of the Continental Army, no matter which one is chosen for purposes of comparison, the conscript system renders it a part of the nation concerned, identifies the Army with the nation, and incidentally takes out the element of freedom. A man in a conscript army is serving because he must, and no matter how patriotic he may be, there are times when this is brought home to him very forcibly by the discipline without which no army could exist. In the British Army, on the other hand, the men serving are there by their own choice. This fact gives them a sense that the discipline, no matter how distasteful it may be, is a necessity to their training. By their enlistment they chose to undergo it. But the British Army, until the present war linked it onto the man in the street, was not a part of the nation, but a thing distinct from the nation. It was a profession apart, and none too enviable a profession in the opinion of many, but something to be avoided by men in equivalent walks of civilian life. There are advantages as well as disadvantages in the voluntary system by which our army is raised and maintained. As an advantage may be set first the spirit of the men. Having enlisted voluntarily and ascertained by experience that they must make the best of it or be considered utterly worthless, men in a voluntary army gain a spirit that conscripts can never attain. They are soldiers of their own free will, with regimental traditions to maintain, and practice has demonstrated that they form the finest fighting body as a whole among all the armies of the world. On the other hand, they have no political significance and are but little understood as regards their needs and the constitution of the force to which they belong. In France, for instance, the rule is every citizen a soldier, and it is a rule which is observed with but very few exceptions. The result is that every citizen who has been a soldier is also a voter, and in the matter of army requirements he votes in an understanding way, while the British voter, with the exception of the small percentage who have served in the army, is as a rule unmoved by army needs and questions. To this extent, the army suffers from the voluntary system, though the quality of the army itself under present voluntary conditions may be held to compensate for this. It is doubtful whether it does compensate. Further, the voluntary system makes life in the ranks a totally different thing from civilian life. 
In conscript armies, the discipline to which men are subjected makes their life different from that of their civilian days, but not to such an extent as in the voluntary British Army. The civilian can never quite understand the soldier. Kipling came nearer than any other civilian in his understanding, but even he failed altogether to appreciate the soldier of today. Perhaps he had a better understanding of the soldier of the 80s and 90s before the South African War had come to awaken the army to the need for individual training and the development of initiative. However that may be, no man has yet written of the soldier as he really is, because the task has been usually attempted by civilians to whom the soldier rarely shows his real self. Soldiers have themselves given us glimpses of their real life, but usually they have specialized on the dramatic and the picturesque. It is necessary, if one would understand the soldier and his inner life, that one should have a grasp of the monotony of soldiering, the drill and riding school, the barrack room routine, and all that makes up the daily life, as well as the exceptional and picturesque. In the following chapters, showing as far as possible the inner life of the army from the point of view of the soldier, an attempt has been made to show the average of life in each branch of the service. Exceptions occur. The quality of the commanding officer makes all the difference in the life of the unit which he commands. Again, apart from the influence exercised by the personality of the commanding officer, that of the company or squadron officer is a very potent factor in the lives of the men under his command. The British Army, fine fighting machine though it is, is not perfect, and there are instances of bad commanding officers, bad squadron and company officers, just as there are instances of superlatively good ones. Between these is the influence exerted by the mass on the mass from which an average picture may be drawn. That picture is the portrait of the British soldier, second to none. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of the British Army from Within》by E. Charles Vivian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Chapter Two: The Way of the Recruit* The way of the recruit, though still a hard one, is not so hard as it used to be, for especially in the cavalry and artillery, various modifications have been introduced by which the youngster is broken in gradually to his work. This is not all to the good, for under the new way of working, the training which precedes dismissal from recruits' training to the standing of a trained soldier takes longer, and submitting the recruit to a less strenuous form of life for the period through which it lasts does not produce quite so handy and quick a man as the one who was kept at it from dawn till dark, with liberty at the end of his official day's work to clean up equipment for the next day. Still, the annual training of the dismissed soldier is a more strenuous business now than in old time, so probably the final result is about the same. The recruit's first requirement after he has interviewed the recruiting sergeant on the subject of enlistment is to take the oath, a very quick and simple matter, and then to pass the doctor, which is not so simple. The recruit is stripped, sounded, tested for full physical efficiency, and made to pass tests in eyesight and breathing, which, if he emerges satisfactorily, proclaim him as near physical perfection as humanity can get without a course of physical culture, and that course is administered during his first year of service. Kept under the wing of the recruiting sergeant for a matter of hours or days, as the case may be, the recruit is at last drafted off to his depot, or direct to his unit, where his real training begins in earnest. We may take the case of a recruit who had enlisted from mixed motives, arrived at a station whence he had to make his way to barracks in the evening in order to begin his new life. Here are his impressions of beginning life in the army. He went up a hill and along a muddy lane, and arriving at the barracks, inquired as he had been told to do for the quartermaster sergeant of C Squadron. He was directed to the quartermaster sergeant's office, and on arrival there was asked his name and the nature of his business by a young corporal, who took life as a joke and regarded recruits as a special form of food for amusement. 
Having ascertained the name of the recruit, the corporal, who was a kindly fellow at heart, took him down to the regimental coffee bar and provided him with a meal of cold meat, bread, and coffee, at the squadron's expense, of course, for the provision of the meal was a matter of duty. The corporal then indicated the room in which the recruit was to sleep and left him. The recruit opened the door of the room and looked in. It was a long room with a row of narrow beds down each side, and in the middle two tables on iron trestles, whereon were several basins. On almost every bed sat a man busily engaged in cleaning some article of clothing or equipment. Some were cleaning buttons, some were pipe-claying belts, some were engaged with sword hilts and brick dust, some were cleaning boots. All were cleaning up as if their lives depended on it, for lights out would be sounded at a quarter past ten, and it was already past nine o'clock. When they saw the recruit, they gave him greeting. Ah, here's another one, they cried. Here's another victim. And other phrases which led this particular recruit to think, quite erroneously, that he had come to something very bad indeed. Two or three were singing, with more noise than melody, a song which was very old when Queen Anne died. It was one of the ditties of the regiment, sung by its men on all possible and most impossible occasions. One man shouted to the recruit that he had better flap before he drew his issue, and that he could not understand at all. Translated into civilian language, it meant that he had better desert before he exchanged his civilian clothing for regimental attire, but this he learned later. They seemed a jolly crowd, very fond of flavoring their language with words which in civilian estimation were terms of abuse, but passed as common currency here. The recruit stood wondering. Out of all these beds, there seemed to be no bed for him. After a minute or two, however, the corporal in charge of the room came up to him and pointed out to him a bed in one corner of the room. Its usual occupant was on guard for twenty-four hours, and the recruit was informed that he could occupy that bed for the night. In the morning he could go to the quartermaster's store and draw blankets, sheets, a pillow, and biscuits for his own use. After that he would be allotted a bed cot to himself. Biscuits, it must be explained, are square mattresses of choir, of which three placed end to end form a full-sized mattress for a military bed cot. Sitting on the borrowed bed cot, the recruit was able to take a good look round. The ways of these men, their quickness in cleaning and polishing articles of equipment, were worth watching, he decided. They joked and chaffed each other, they sang scraps of songs, allegedly pathetic and allegedly humorous. They shouted from one end of the room to the other in order to carry on conversations. They called the army names, they called each other names, and they called individuals who were evidently absent yet more names, none of them complimentary. They made a lot of noise, and in that noise one of them, having finished his cleaning, slept. When he snored, one of his companions threw a boot at him, and since the boot hit him, he woke up and looked round, but in vain. Therefore he calmly went to sleep again, but this time he did not snore. The recruit, who had come out of an ordinary civilian home, and hitherto had had only the vaguest of notions as to what the army was really like, wondered if he were dreaming, and then realized that he himself was one of these men, since he had voluntarily given up certain years of his life to their business. With that reflection he undressed and got into bed. After lights out had sounded and been promptly obeyed, he went to sleep. His impressions are typical, and his introduction to the barrack room may serve to record the view gained by the majority of those who enlist, that first glimpse of military life is something utterly strange and incomprehensible, and the recruit sleeps his first night in barracks, or stays awake, bewildered by the novelty of his surroundings, and a little afraid. In a few days the recruit begins to feel a little more at home in his new surroundings. One of his first ordeals is that of being fitted with clothing, and with few exceptions all his clothing is ready-made, for the quartermaster's store of a unit contains a variety of sizes and fittings of every article required, and from among these a man must be fitted out from head to foot. The regimental master tailor attends at the clothes fitting and makes notes of alterations required, shortening or lengthening sleeves, letting out here and taking in there. When clothes and boots have been fitted, the recruit is issued a small kit 
consisting of brushes and cleaning materials for himself and his clothes and equipment, even unto a toothbrush and a comb. As a rule, he omits the ceremony of locking these things away in his box when he returns to the barrack room, with the result that most of them are missing when he looks on the shelf or in the box where he placed them. For in a barrack room, although all things are not common, the property of the recruit is fair game, and he catches who can. Gradually, as the recruit learns the need for taking care of such property as he wishes to retain, he also learns barrack room slang and phrasing. In the army, one is never late, one is pushed. One does not eat, but one scoffs. A man who dodges work is said to swing the lead, and there is no such thing as work, for it is graft or calm. Practically every man, too, has his nickname. All clerks are Nobby, all Palmers are Pedlar, all Welshmen in other than Welsh regiments are Taffy, all Robinsons are Jack, and every surname in like fashion has its regular nickname. But contrary to the belief entertained by the average civilian, the soldier does not readily take to nicknames for his superiors. For his own officers, he sometimes finds equivalents to their names through their personal peculiarities. But if one spoke to a soldier of K of K, the soldier would request an explanation, while Bob's for Lord Roberts might be understood, but would not be appreciated. The general officer and the superior worthy of respect gets his full title from the soldier at all times, and nicknames, except for comrades of the same company or squadron, form a mark of contempt, especially when applied to commissioned officers. Sometimes the soldier finds a nickname for a comrade out of a personal peculiarity, as when one is particularly mean he gets the name of Shonk or Shonky, which is equivalent to Jew with a reference to usury and extortion. If a regimental officer gets a nickname, it may be generally assumed that he is not held in very great respect by his men. Bulgy, of whom more anon, was a very fat young lieutenant with more bulk than brains. Duffer was another lieutenant, and his title explains itself. It was always used in conjunction with his surname. Bouncer was a major who had attained his rank by accident and left the service because he knew it was hopeless to anticipate further promotion. The officer who commands the respect of his men does not get nicknamed, and the recruit very often learns to call his superiors by their proper names when he has occasion to mention superior officers in course of conversation with his comrades. As a rule, the recruit is subjected to one or more practical jokes by his comrades in his early days as a soldier. In cavalry regiments, a favorite form of joke is to get the recruit to go to the farrier major for his shoeing money, a mythical allowance which, it is alleged, every recruit receives at the beginning of his service. The pretext might appear a bit thin if only one man were concerned in the deception, but the recruit is assured by a whole barrack room full of soldiers that it's a fact and no hank, and in about five cases out of ten he goes as to the farrier major, who, entering into the spirit of the thing, sends the victim in to the orderly room sergeant or the provost sergeant, and from here the recruit goes on to the next official chosen until he finds out the hoax. If a non-commissioned officer can be found with the same sense of humor as induced the shoeing money hoax, he, usually a lance corporal, orders the recruit to go to the sergeant major or some other highly placed non-com for the key of the square. As a rule, this request from the recruit provokes the sergeant major to wrath, and the poor recruit gets a hot time. There is a legend of a recruit having been sent to the quartermaster's store to get his mouth measured for a spoon, but it may be regarded as legend, pure and simple, for there are limits to the credulity even of recruits, though authenticated instances of hoaxes which have been practiced show that much may be done by means of an earnest manner and the thorough preservation of gravity in giving recommendations to the victim. Many a man has gone to the armorer to get his spurs fitted, and probably more will go yet. If a civilian takes a thorough dislike to his work, he has always the opportunity of quitting it. If he fails to satisfy his employers, he is either warned or dismissed. In the army, the man who dislikes his work has to pocket the dislike and go on with the work, 
while if his employers the regimental authorities have any fault to find with him they do not express it by dismissal until various forms and quantities of punishment for slackness have been resorted to the recruit gets far more punishments than the old soldier for the latter has learned what to do and what to avoid in order to make life simple for himself his punishments usually arise out of looking on the beer when it is brown to an extent incompatible with the fulfilment of his duties and when sober he generally manages to evade office and its results but the recruit finds that the corporal in charge of his room the drill instructor in charge of him at drill the sergeant in charge of his section or troop the non-commissioned officer under whose supervision he does his fatigues and a host of other superiors are all capable of either placing him in the guard-room to await trial or of informing him that he is under open arrest and equally liable for trial and this for offences which would not count as such in civilian life for three-quarters of the military crimes are not crimes at all in the civil code being late on parade a dirty button that is a button not sufficiently brilliant in its polish the need of a shave a hasty word to one in authority and half a hundred other apparent trivialities form grounds for wheeling a man up or running him in and the guard-room to which he retires is the clink while if he is so persistent in the commission of offences as to merit detention the military form of imprisonment he is said to go to the glass house that is he is sent to the detention barracks for the term to which he is sentenced and his punishment spoken of as cells and never anything else a minor form of punishment confined to barracks or defaulters involves the doing of the regiment's dirty work in a few hours usually devoted to relaxation with drill in full marching order for an hour every night and answering one's name at the guard-room at stated intervals throughout the afternoon and evening in order to prevent the delinquent from leaving barracks this the soldier calls doing jankers and the bugle or trumpet call which orders him out on the defaulters parade is known as patty doyle heaven only knows for what reason unless one patty doyle was a notorious offender against military discipline in far back times and his reputation has survived his personal characteristics in the memory of the soldier the accused whoever he may be is paraded first before his company squadron or battery officer and the charge against him is read out first evidence is taken from the superior officer who makes the charge and second evidence from any one who may have been witness to the occurrence which has caused the trouble then the accused is asked what he has to say in mitigation of his offence and if he is wise unless the accusation is very unjust indeed he answers a nothing sir then if the case is a minor one the company or squadron or battery officer delivers sentence if however the crime is one meriting a punishment exceeding seven days confined to barracks the case is beyond the jurisdiction of the junior officer and must be sent to the officer commanding the regiment or battalion or artillery brigade for trial in that case the offender is paraded with an escort of a non-commissioned officer and man and marched on to the veranda of the regimental orderly room when office sounds almost always at eleven o'clock in the morning when the colonel commanding the unit or in case of his absence his deputy decrees the offender is marched into the presence of his judge the adjutant of the regiment reads the charge the evidence is stated as in the case of trial by a company or squadron officer and the colonel pronounces his verdict acquittals are rare not that there is any injustice but it is assumed and usually with good reason that if a man is wheeled up he has been doing something he ought not to have done then too the soldier's explanation of how he came to get into trouble are far too plausible officers with experience of the soldier and his ways come to understand that he can explain away anything and find an excuse for everything it is safe in the majority of cases to take a harsh view however the punishments inflicted are in the majority of cases light jankers though uncomfortable is not degrading to any great extent and the man who has had a taste or two of this wholesome corrective will usually be a more careful if not a better soldier in future 
sells is a different matter not that it lowers a man to any extent in the estimation of his comrades but it is a painful experience practically corresponding to the imprisonment with hard labor to which a civilian misdemeanant is subjected it involves also total loss of pay from the time of arrest to the end of the period of punishment while confinement to barracks involves only the actual punishment and unless the crime is absence there is no loss of pay drunkenness is punished by an officially graded system of fines as well as by jankers or cells the average man however performs work of average quality avoids drunkenness and keeps to time the result being that he does not undergo punishment barrack room life for the recruit is a fairly simple matter he makes his own bed and sweeps the floor round it he folds his blanket and sheets to the prescribed pattern the way in which he folds his kit and clothing also is regulated for him by the company or squadron authorities and for the rest he is kept too busy throughout the day at drill and too busy throughout the evening in preparing for the next day's drill to get into mischief to any appreciable extent the recruit who involves himself in crime is more often than not looking for trouble it has already been stated that a full day's work for the recruit is a strenuous business if we take the average day of a recruit in say a cavalry regiment and follow him from reveille to lights out it will be seen that he is kept quite sufficiently busy reveille sounds anywhere between four thirty and six thirty a m according to the season of the year and before the sound of the trumpet has ceased the corporal in charge of the room will be heard inviting his men to show a leg there the invitation is promptly complied with for in a space of fifteen minutes all the men in the room have to dress wash if they feel inclined to and get out on early morning stable parade to answer their names they are then marched down to stables where they turn out the stable bedding and groom their horses for about an hour the horses are then taken out to water returned to stables and fed and the men file back to their rooms to get breakfast and prepare for the morning's drill this latter involves a complete change of clothing from the rough canvas stable outfit to clean service dress and puttees for riding school use the riding school lesson is usually over by half past ten and after this the recruit takes his horse back to the stables off saddles and returns to the barrack room to change into canvas clothing once more and enjoy the ten minute more or less of relaxation that falls to him before the trumpeter sounds stables going to stables again the men groom their horses and when these have been passed as clean by the troop sergeant or troop officer the troopers set to work and clean the steelwork and leather the way in which this is done in the army may be judged from the fact that after a morning's parade it takes a full hour to clean saddle and headdress and render them fit for inspection it is one o'clock before midday stables are finished with and then of course it is time for dinner for this principal meal of the day one hour is allowed but that hour includes the getting ready for the afternoon parade for foot drill in which the cavalry recruit is taught the use of the sword and all movements that he will have to perform dismounted this lasts an hour or thereabouts and is followed by a return to the barrack room and another change of clothing this time into gymnasium outfit the recruit is then marched to the gymnasium where for the space of another hour the gymnastic instructor has his turn at licking the raw material into shape marched back to the barrack room once more the recruit is free to devote what remains to him of the minutes before five o'clock to cleaning the spurs swords etc which have become soiled by the morning's riding school work at five stable sounds again the orders for the day are read out on parade and the men march to stables to groom bed down water and feed their horses a business to which an hour is devoted tea follows and then unless the recruit has been warned for night guard he is free to complete the preparation of his equipment for the next day's work and use what little spare time is left in such relaxation as may please him in the infantry the number of parades done during the day is about the same there is of course no stables but the time which the cavalryman devotes to this is taken up by musketry instruction foot drill and fatigues 
in the artillery there is more to learn than in the cavalry for a driver has to learn to drive the horse he rides and lead another one as well while the gunner has plenty to keep him busy in the mechanism of his gun its cleaning and the various duties connected with it to the recruit the perpetual cleaning polishing burnishing and scouring are naturally somewhat irksome and it is not until a man has undergone the whole of his recruit's training that he begins dimly to understand the extreme delicacy and fineness of the instruments of his trade or profession he comes gradually to realize that a rifle is a very delicate piece of mechanism a spot of rust on a sword may impair the efficiency of the blade if allowed to remain and eat in while a big gun is a complicated piece of machinery needing as much care as a repeater watch if it is to work efficiently and a horse is as helpless and needs as much care as a baby at first sight there seems no need for the eternal cleaning of buttons polishing of spurs and other trivial items of work which enter into the daily life of a soldier but all these things are directed to the one end of making the man careful of trifles and thoroughly efficient in every detail of his work old soldiers having finished with foot drill known in the barrack room as square and with riding school which is allowed to keep its name have a way of looking down on recruits the chief aim of the recruit if he be a normal man is to get dismissed from riding school square and gymnasium and the attitude of the old soldier encourages this ambition usually a recruit is placed under an old soldier for tuition in his work and it depends very much on the quality of the old hands in a barrack room as to what quality of trained man is turned out therefrom service counts more than personal worth and in fact more than anything else in barrack room life the man with two years service will get into trouble sooner or later if he ventures to dictate to the man of three years or more service whatever the relative mental qualifications of the two men concerned may be before you came up or before you enlisted are the most crushing phrases that can be applied to a fellow soldier and no amount of efficiency atones for lack of years to count toward transfer to the reserve or discharge from the service to pension so far as the infantry recruit is concerned foot drill and musketry together with a certain amount of fatigues comprises the day's routine with foot drill may be bracketed bayonet drill in which the recruit is taught the various thrusts and parries which can be made with that weapon for which the british infantryman has been famed since before wellington's time both in the cavalry and infantry every man has to fire a musketry course once a year the recruit's course of musketry however is a more detailed and in a way more instructive business than the course which the trained man has to undergo the recruit has to be taught that squeezing motion for the trigger which does not disturb the aim of the rifle he has to be taught also the extreme care with which a rifle must be handled cleaned and kept it may be said that the recruit's course is designed to lay the foundation on which the trained man's course of musketry is built and at the end of the recruit's course the men who have undergone it are graded off into first second and third class shots while marksmen are super firsts on the whole the first year of a man's service is the hardest of any so far as peace soldiering is concerned there is more reason in this than appears on the surface a recruit joins the army somewhere about the age of twenty the official limit is from eighteen to twenty-five it is evident that in his first year of service a man is at such a stage of muscular and mental growth as to render him capable of being moulded much more readily than in the later military years it is best that he should be shaped as far as possible while he is yet not quite formed and set and though the process of shaping may involve what looks like an undue amount of physical exertion it is in reality not beyond the capabilities of such men as doctors pass into the service it is true that the percentage of cases of heart disease occurring in the british army is rather a high one 
but this is due not to the strenuous training but in many cases to excessive cigarette smoking and in others to the strained posture of attention combined with predisposition to the disease the recruit has a hard time certainly but many men work harder and the years of service which follow on the strenuous period of recruits training are more enjoyable by contrast end of chapter two chapter three of the british army from within by e charles vivian this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three officers and non-coms the higher ranks of officers have very little to do with the daily life of the soldier two or three times a year the general officer commanding the station comes round on a tour of inspection while other general officers and inspecting officers pay visits at times the highest rank however with which the soldier is brought in frequent contact is the commanding officer of his own regiment or battalion this post is usually held by a lieutenant colonel as by the time an officer has attained to a full colonelcy he is either posted to the staff or passed out from the service to half pay under the age limit by the time a man has reached the rank of lieutenant colonel he is as a rule far more conversant with the ways and habits of the soldier than the soldier himself is willing to admit it would surprise men in the majority of cases if they could be made to realize how intimately the old man knows his regiment the old man is responsible for the efficiency of the regiment in every detail since as its head he is responsible for the efficiency of the officers controlling the various departments he is assisted in his work by the second in command who is usually a major and is not attached to any particular squadron or company but is responsible for the internal working and domestic arrangements incidental to the life of his unit these two are assisted in their work by the adjutant a junior officer sometimes captain and sometimes lieutenant who holds his post for a stated term and during his adjutancy is expected to qualify fully in the headquarters staff work which the conduct of a military unit involves so far as commissioned officers are concerned these three form the headquarters staff it must not be overlooked however that the quartermaster who is either a lieutenant or a captain and has won his commission from the ranks in the majority of cases is also unattached to any particular squadron or company he is or should be under the control of the second in command since as his title indicates he is concerned with the quarters of the regiment and with all that pertains to its domestic economy he cannot however be regarded as a part of the headquarters staff his position is unique somewhere between commissioned and non-commissioned rank and it is very rarely that he is accorded the position of the officer who has come to the service through sandhurst the colonel and the second in command as a rule know their regiment thoroughly they know the special weaknesses of the company or squadron officers they are conversant with the virtues and the failings of captain blank and lieutenant dash they know all about the troubles in the married quarters and they are fully informed of the happenings in the sergeant's mess not that there is any system of espionage in the army but the man who reaches the rank of colonel is under the present conditions governing promotions keen-witted and in the dissemination of all kinds of news from matter for legitimate comment to rank scandal a military unit is about equivalent to a ladies sewing meeting the colonel and the second in command know all about things because being observant men they cannot help knowing to each squadron of cavalry battery of artillery or company of infantry is allotted a captain or major as officer commanding and in the same way as a colonel is responsible for the efficiency of his regiment so the captain or major is responsible for the efficiency of the squadron battery or company under his charge the squadron or company officer is usually not quite so conversant with the more intimate details of his work as is the lieutenant colonel for one thing he has not had so much experience for another he may not have the mental capacity required in a lieutenant colonel the squadron or company officer is usually a jolly good fellow mindful of discipline and careful of the comfort of his men but there are cases exceptions certainly of utter incompetency 
a battery officer on the other hand is of a different stamp of the three arms the artillery demands most in the way of efficiency and knowledge the mechanism of the guns creates an atmosphere in which officers study and train to a far greater extent than a cavalry and infantry officer the battery officer in nine cases out of ten is quite as competent to take charge of an artillery brigade as the cavalry or infantry lieutenant colonel is to take charge of his regiment or battalion next in order of rank are the lieutenants and subalterns youngsters learning the business the lieutenant having won his second star is a reasonable being the subaltern fresh from sandhurst or woolwich and oppressed by the weight of his own importance is occasionally too big for his boots a bumptious individual whom his superiors endeavour to restrain but whom his inferiors in rank must obey though they have little belief in his judgment or in his capability to command them intelligently this may appear harsh judgment on the subaltern but experience of things military confirms it sandhurst turns out its pupils in a raw state they have the theory of their work but just as it takes years to make a soldier so it takes years of actual military work to make an efficient officer and the trained man in the ranks generally views with extreme disfavour the introduction of a raw subaltern from sandhurst into the company or squadron to which he belongs though very often the young officer shapes to his work quickly wins the respect and confidence of his men and adds materially to the efficiency and well-being of his troop or section again a young officer may not be popular among his men in time of peace but may win all their respect and confidence on the field where values alter and are frequently reversed from peace equivalents lieutenants and subalterns are given charge of a troop in the cavalry a gun or section according to the number of young officers available in a battery and of a section of men in an infantry company nominally in command of their men they are in practice largely dependent on their senior non-commissioned officers for the efficiency of the men under their command an officer's real efficiency in peace service does not begin until he gets his company or squadron in other words until he is promoted to the rank of captain next in grade of rank to the commissioned officer stands the regimental sergeant major who is termed a warrant officer since the warrant which he holds in virtue of his rank distinguishes him from non-commissioned officers he has usually sixteen years or more of service he has even more knowledge of the ways of the regiment than the commanding officer himself and his place is with the headquarters staff while his duties lie in the supervision and control of the non-commissioned officers and their messes and training his position is peculiar the etiquette of the service prevents him from making close friends among non-commissioned officers while that same etiquette prevents commissioned officers from making a close friend of him the only non-commissioned officer who stands near him in rank is the quartermaster sergeant who is directly under the control of the quartermaster and is also a member of the headquarters staff from this point of rank downward the ways of the different arms of the service diverge in the infantry the chief non-commissioned officer of a company is the color sergeant who is responsible both for internal economy and efficiencies at drill in the cavalry and artillery the presence of horses and the far greater amount of equipment involved divide the work that is done in the infantry by the color sergeant into two parts in the cavalry each squadron and in the artillery each battery is controlled so far as drill and efficiency in the field is concerned by a squadron sergeant major and a battery sergeant major respectively while the domestic economy of the squadron or battery is managed by squadron quartermaster sergeant or battery quartermaster sergeant next in order of rank come the sergeants the non-commissioned equivalent to troop and section officers but of far more actual importance than these since parades frequently take place in the absence of the troop or section officer while the troop or section sergeant is at all times responsible to his superiors for the efficiency of his men the rank of sergeant is seldom attained in less than seven years and thus the man of three stripes whom kipling justly described in his famous phrase as the backbone of the army is a man of experience and fully entitled to his post 
next in order of rank to the sergeant is the corporal whose duties lie principally in the maintenance of barrack room discipline though he is largely responsible for the training of squads and sections of men in field work often in the cavalry he is given charge of a troop temporarily and in the artillery though each gun is supposed to be in charge of a sergeant it happens at times that the corporal has charge of the gun the lowest rank of all is that of lance corporal aptly termed half of nothing men resent as a rule any assumption of authority by a lance corporal and yet the lance corporal has to exercise his authority at the risk of being told he was a private only five minutes ago bearing in mind the material from which the army is recruited it is not surprising that a large percentage of lance corporals having tried for themselves what non-commissioned rank feels like give it up and revert to the rank of private there are certain advantages in being a lance corporal there is a distinct advantage for instance in being in charge of the guard instead of having to do sentry go another advantage arises in the matter of fatigues the lance corporal so long as he behaves himself merely takes his turn on the roll after the full corporals in charge of a fatigue party he is a superintendent not a worker so far as fatigues are concerned the chief disadvantage consists in the way in which his former comrades regard him as one concerned in their training and discipline he is no longer to be considered as a comrade and equal by the privates in many infantry units lance corporals are definitely ordered not to fraternize with the men although they perforce sleep in the same rooms and share the same meals the sergeants of each unit taking the regiment or battalion as a unit have their own mess in the same way that the officers have theirs they take all their meals in the mess and they sleep in bunks their separateness from the rank and file is thus emphasized and their control over the men rendered more definite and easy by this separateness in each unit there is also established a corporal's mess but this is merely a recreation room in the same way that the canteen forms a recreation room for the privates corporals and lance corporals take their meals with the men and sleep in the same rooms as the men this especially in the case of lance corporals diminishes authority but at the same time it renders easier the maintenance of barrack room discipline and the control of barrack room life for which corporals and lance corporals are held responsible mainly in connection with the development of initiative which arose out of the experience gained from the south african war a system of understudies has been created among non-commissioned officers and senior privates each rank in turn is expected to be able to assume the duties of the rank immediately above it in case of necessity and all are trained to this end it may be remarked that certain certificates of education must be obtained by non-commissioned officers as soon as a lance corporal gets his stripe he is expected to go to a military school in the evenings until he has obtained a second-class certificate of education the qualifications for this being equivalent to those evidenced by the possession of an ordinary fourth standard school certificate the higher ranks of non-commissioned officers that is all above the rank of sergeant are expected to qualify for a first-class army certificate of education which is quite equivalent to an x seventh standard council school certificate further every non-commissioned officer must obtain certificates of proficiency in drill and musketry showing that he is a capable instructor as well as fully conversant with drill on his own account the way to promotion is paved with certificates of various kinds there are courses in signaling scouting musketry drill and the hundred and one items of a soldier's work these courses qualify for instructorship and some of them are open only to non-commissioned officers the passing of such courses increases the efficiency of the non-commissioned officers concerned is evidence of fitness for further promotion and is rewarded accordingly technically speaking the post lance corporal is an appointment not a promotion and therefore the lance corporal can be deprived of his stripe on the word of his commanding officer with the exception of the rank of lance sergeant which admits a corporal to the sergeant's mess and takes him out of the barrack room without a corresponding increase of pay 
All ranks from corporal upward count as promotions, and can only be reduced by way of punishment by the sentence of a court martial. A regimental court martial, which has power to reduce a corporal to the ranks and inflict certain limited punishments on a private, is composed of three officers of the unit concerned. A district court martial, with wider powers, including the reduction of a sergeant to the ranks, is composed of three officers. The president must not in any case be below the rank of captain, and usually is a major, and he and the two junior officers who form the tribunal usually belong to other regiments than that of the accused. Military law differs in many respects from civil law. There is, of course, no such thing as a trial by jury. The adjutant of the regiment to which the accused belongs is always the nominal prosecutor, but in actual practice the witnesses for the prosecution are of far more importance than is he. Evidence for the prosecution is taken first, then the evidence for the defense. The accused, if he wishes, can speak in his own defense. If the court is satisfied of the innocence of the accused, he is at once discharged. If, on the other hand, there is any doubt of his innocence, he is marched out while the court consider their finding and sentence, and the latter is not announced until the two or three days necessary for confirmation of the proceedings by the general officer commanding the station have elapsed. The promulgation of a court-martial sentence is an impressive ceremony. The regiment or battalion to which the accused belongs is formed up to occupy three sides of a square, facing inwards. The accused, under armed escort, together with the regimental sergeant-major and the adjutant of the unit, occupy the fourth side of the square, and the adjutant reads a summary of the proceedings, concluding with a recital of the sentence on the accused. In the case of a private, the ceremony is then at an end, and the regiment is marched away, while the accused returns to the guardroom under escort. In the case of a non-commissioned officer, the regimental sergeant-major formally cuts the stripes from off the arm of the accused. It is to be hoped that in the near future this court-martial parade, degrading to the accused man, and not by any means an edifying spectacle, for his comrades, will be abolished, for a record of the court-martial and of the punishment inflicted is always inserted in the regimental orders of the day. Fortunately, however, court-martials are infrequent occurrences, and so far as the non-commissioned officer is concerned, life is a fairly pleasant business. There is plenty of hard work to keep him in good health, but there are also many hours that can be spent in pleasant recreation, and the man who takes his profession seriously may now hope to attain to higher rank. Promotions to commissions from the ranks have in the past been infrequent, but the prospect is now much more hopeful, and in any case the non-commissioned officer can look forward to a pension which will serve as a perpetual reminder that his time has not been wasted. End of chapter 3 Chapter Four of the British Army from Within by E. Charles Vivian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four: Infantry. The old-time term light infantry has little meaning at present, as far as difference in the stamp of man and the weight of equipment carried is concerned. One infantry battalion is equal to another in respect of lightness except that some highland battalions recruiting from districts which provide exceptionally brawny specimens of humanity obtain a taller and weightier average of men varieties of equipment in the old days made infantry heavy and light but the modern infantryman is kept as light as possible in the matter of equipment in all units certain battalions possess and are very proud of distinctions awarded them for feats on the field of battle thus it is permitted to one infantry regiment including all its battalions to wear the regimental badge both on the front and the back of the helmet in review order also on their field service caps to commemorate an action in which the men were surrounded and fought back to back until they had extricated themselves from their perilous position or rather until the survivors had extricated themselves 
In another regiment, the sergeants are permitted to wear the sash over the same shoulder as the officers, in view of the fact that on one occasion all the officers were killed and the non-commissioned officers took command with noteworthy results. Yet another distinction, but of a different kind, is the concession made to Irish regiments in allowing them to wear sprigs of shamrock on St. Patrick's Day. In the review order or full dress of modern infantrymen, and in fact of all British soldiers, there are certain buttons and fittings which serve no useful purpose, and soldiers themselves even sometimes wonder why these things are worn. The reason is that in old time all these fittings had a use. The buttons on the back of the tunic supported belts which are no longer worn, or covered pockets which no longer exist. There is a reason also in the officer wearing his sash on one shoulder and the sergeant his on another, and in the same way there is a reason for every seemingly useless fitting in a soldier's review uniform. It perpetuates a tradition of the particular battalion or regiment concerned, or it keeps alive a tradition of the service as a whole. To the outsider, these may appear useless formalities, but they are not so in reality. The soldier is intensely proud of these things, which make for esprit de corps, and maintain the spirit of the army quite as much as material advantages. The actual spirit in which the infantryman views his work is a difficult thing to assess. One noteworthy example of that spirit is the case of Piper Findletter, who, wounded beyond the power of movement at Dargai, sat up and piped, an amazing piece of courage and coolness under fire. Yet that same Piper Findletter, invalided home and out of the service, could display himself on a music hall stage, an action which was incomprehensible to the civilian mind. But to the average infantryman there was nothing incongruous in the two actions. One was as much the right of the man as the other was to his credit, and Finletter was typical of the British infantryman. Under the present system each infantry regiment is divided into two or more battalions. Under the old system each battalion was distinguished by a number, but the numbers have been abolished in favor of names of counties or districts, and two or more battalions form the regiment of a county or division of a county. It is very seldom that these two or more portions of the same regiment meet each other, for in the case of a two-battalion regiment, one battalion is usually on foreign service while the other is domiciled in England, and the home battalion feeds the one on foreign service with recruits as needed to keep the latter up to strength. A notable exception to this rule occurred in the case of the Norfolk Regiment a few years ago when the 1st and 2nd Battalions met at Blurmfontein, one outward bound at the beginning of its term of foreign service and the other about to start for home. The infantryman is fitted for what constitutes the greater part of his work when the season's training is over, by what is known as route marching. In this, a battalion is started out at the beginning of the route marching season on a march of a few miles in light order, carrying rifles and bayonets only, perhaps. The distance covered is gradually increased, and the weight of equipment carried by the men is also increased, until the men concerned are carrying their full packs and marching twelve or fourteen miles a day. Service conditions are maintained as far as possible so as to make the men fit for long marches at any time. By this means the men's feet are hardened and the men themselves brought thoroughly into condition, while weaklings are picked out and marked down for future reference. Falling out on a route march without good and sufficient reason means days to barracks for the offender at the least, and cells is a possibility. The work of the infantryman is less complex than that of any other branch of the service. He has to be trained to march well and to know how to use his rifle and bayonet. Principally, given the physical endurance for the marching part of this business, he has to learn to shoot, and the simplicity of his duties is compensated for by the thoroughness with which he is taught. Then again, discipline is of necessity stricter in infantry units than in other branches of the service. The cavalryman, with a horse to care for, as well as himself and his arms and equipment, and the driver or gunner of artillery, with two horses and two sets of saddlery, or his gun or limber to mine, 
is kept busy most of the time without an excess of discipline but the infantryman in time of peace is concerned only with himself his arms and equipment and his barrack room a small total when compared with the cares of the man in the cavalry or artillery by way of compensation the infantryman is made to give more attention to his barrack room he is restricted in a way that would not be possible in the cavalry or artillery in the way in which he employs his leisure hours and parades are made to keep his hands out of mischief as well as to train him to thorough efficiency a brigade of infantry consisting of four battalions looks a perfectly uniform mass of men on say a service dress parade but intimate knowledge of the characteristics of the men in each battalion reveals a world of difference each regiment has its own traditions and each battalion differs widely from the rest in its methods of working its way of issuing commands and its internal arrangements there is a standard of bugle calls for the whole army but practically every infantry battalion infuses a certain amount of individuality into the method of sounding the call the buglers of the rifle brigade for instance would scorn to sound their calls in the way that the east surreys or the york and lancaster battalion sound theirs and conversely a york and lancaster or an east surrey man would smile at the bugle call of the rifle brigade battalion the districts from which men are recruited too account for many little peculiarities in the ways of different battalions there is obviously a world of difference between the ways in which a man of the king's own yorkshire light infantry will view a given situation and the view adopted by a man of the east surreys for one is re yorkshire while the other is cockney all through dialects and regimental slang combined make the language of the one almost unintelligible to the other and while each arrives at precisely the same end by slightly varying means each claims superiority over the other the spirit of the british infantryman with very few exceptions consists mainly in his belief that he is a member of the best company in the very best battalion of infantry in the service as for his particular arm of the service he points with pride to the fact that he comes in from a march and gets to his food while the poor cavalryman is still fretting about in the horse lines and he has no two sets of harness to bother about after a field day he slings his equipment on the shelf and goes off to his meal when the field day is over while the poor gunner is busy with an oil rag keeping the rust from eating into his guns and its fittings until the time comes to clean it thus the infantryman on his advantages and with some justice too but in the barrack room the cavalryman and artilleryman have the advantage they can make their own beds and snooze when work is done secure from interruption until stables shall sound and turn them out to care for their long-faced chums the infantryman on the other hand has to prepare for barrack room and kit inspections at all times he has to wet scrub and dry scrub the floors blacklead the table trestles and legs of forms whitewash himself tired on articles which to the civilian eye appear already sufficiently coated with whitewash pick grass off the drill ground and carry out a host of orders which seem designed for his especial irritation though in reality they are designed to keep him at work and prevent him from being utterly idle in certain hours the infantryman must be made to work to keep him in condition and if the work of a necessary nature is not sufficient to keep him employed then work is made for him it must be said that owing to the existence of undiscerning commanding and other officers a lot of this work although undoubtedly it fulfils its purpose is irritating to the last degree and might with advantage be exchanged for tasks which would exercise the intelligence of the men instead of rousing their disgust grass picking is an especially detested form of labor which is common in some battalions of the infantry in most units however men are put to useful occupations in some stations where available ground permits gardens are allotted to the men who cultivate creditable supplies of vegetables for the use of their messes and flowers for decorative purposes another favorite form of exercise in which the infantryman is indulged with what appears to him unnecessary frequency is kit inspection 
At first sight it would seem that the circumstance of an officer inspecting the kit and equipment of his men is not one which would cause an undue amount of trouble, but the reverse of this is the case in practice. Each man has to lay down his kit to a regulation pattern. At the head of the bed, on which the clothing and equipment is laid out, the reds and blues and khaki-colored squares represent much time spent by the man in folding each article of clothing to the last half-inch of size and form, prescribed by the regulation affecting the way in which kit must be laid down for inspection. Then come the underclothing, knife and fork, razor, prayer book and Bible, brushes and other odds and ends with which every man must be provided. If any article is deficient from the official list, the man is promptly put down for a new article to replace the deficiency, and for this he has to pay. The upkeep of a full kit is most strictly enforced, and in addition to the completeness of the kit, the amount of polish on the various articles calls for much attention on the part of the inspecting officer. A knife or fork not sufficiently bright, boots not quite as well cleaned and polished as they might be, or brass buttons displaying a suspicion of dullness, lead at the least to an order to show again at a stated hour, not the single article but the whole kit, while repeated deficiencies, either in the quantity of the articles or in the evident amount of care bestowed on them, will lead to defaulter's drill or even cells. Kit inspection counts as a parade and not as a fatigue. The latter term is used to imply all kinds of actual work in connection with the maintenance of order in the battalion, and varies from washing up in the sergeant's mess to carrying coals for the barrack room or married quarters. To each unit, as a rule, there is a coal yard attached, and from this a certain amount of coal is issued free each week for cooking purposes while in the winter months a further amount is allotted to the men to burn in the barrack room stoves if the allowance is exceeded and since it is a small one it is usually exceeded the men club round among themselves to purchase more at the rate of a penny or tuppence a man the fetching of this extra coal does not count as a fatigue in the official sense a roll is kept of all men liable for fatigue duty, and each man takes his turn in alphabetical order in the performance of the various tasks that have to be done. As these tasks differ considerably in nature and extent, it follows that the alphabetical way of ordering the roll is as fair as any, though artful dodgers, getting wind of a stiff fatigue ahead, will get out of doing it by exchanging their terms with those men who would otherwise get an easier task. As a rule, sergeant's mess fatigue is one of the least liked, except on Sunday mornings when it releases the man who does it from church parade, of which more later. For the actual housemaid work of the barrack room, a roll is usually kept in each room, and the men of the room take turns at orderly man, as it is called. This involves the final sweeping out of the room after each man has swept under his own bed and round the little bit of floor which is his own particular territory. It involves the care of and responsibility for all the kits in the room while the remainder of the men are out at drill, and also the fetching of all meals and washing up of the plates and basins after each meal. The orderly man of the day is not supposed to leave the room during parade hours except to fetch meals for the rest. It is his duty, after all have gone out, to put the boxes at the foot of the beds in an exact line, that there may be nothing to disturb the symmetry of things when the orderly officer or the color sergeant comes round on a morning visit of inspection. In a home station, as far as infantry is concerned, practically all barrack room inspections take place before one o'clock in the day, and in the afternoons such men as are in the barrack room have it to themselves. It is the rule in some battalions, however, that no beds may be made down before six o'clock, a harsh rule and one which serves no useful purpose, unless it is considered useful to keep a man from lying down to rest. While guard duty is kept as light as possible in mounted branches of the service, it is allowed to assume large proportions in the infantry. 
in a cavalry regiment the main guard which mounts duty for twenty-four hours and has charge of the regimental guard room and prisoners confined therein is composed at the most of a corporal and three men but in the infantry the main guard of a battalion consists of a sergeant a corporal or lance corporal and six men providing three reliefs of two sentries apiece guard duty is done in review order that is to say the men dress up in their best clothes with the last possible polish on metalwork and the best possible pipe clay on all belts and equipment that permit of it and the inspection to which the guard is submitted before taking over its duties is the most searching form of inspection which the soldier has to undergo after he has been dismissed from recruits training the men of the guard do turns of two hours sentry go apiece and then get four hours rest except in very inclement weather when the periods are reduced to one hour of duty and two hours of rest experience has placed it beyond doubt that the two hours on and four hours off is the best way of doing duty in reliefs it imposes less strain on the men who have to keep up their duty for a day and a night than any other form in which it might be arranged certain men in infantry units and in fact in all units are excused from the regular routine of duty in order to fill special posts noteworthy among these are the flag waggers or regimental signalers a body of men maintained at a certain strength for the purpose of signalling messages with flags heliograph or lamps by means of the morse telegraphic code and also with flags at short distances by semaphore bearing in mind the average education among the rank and file it is remarkable with what facility men learn the use of the morse code against this must be set the fact that only selected men are employed as signalers these are taught the alphabet and the various signs employed for special purposes by being grouped in squads and after their preliminary instruction is completed they are sent out to various points from which they send messages to each other under conditions approximating as nearly as possible to those which obtain in active service in order to maintain the signalers of a unit in full practice and efficiency the men are excused from all ordinary parades for a certain part of the year during maneuvers they are attached to the headquarters staff of their unit and carry out their work as signalers not as ordinary duty men the wagging of flags is only a part of their duty for they have to learn the mechanism and use of the heliograph since when sunlight permits of its use this instrument can be employed for the transmission of messages to a far greater distance than is possible even with large flags lamps for signaling by night are operated by a button which alternately obscures and exhibits the light of a lamp placed behind a concentrating lens the practice signaler is as efficient in the use of flags lamps and heliograph as is the post office operator in the use of the ordinary telegraph instrument though the exigencies of field service render military signaling a considerably slower business than ordinary wire telegraphy another course of instruction which carries with it a certain amount of exemption from duty in the infantry is that of scout the practice scout is capable of plotting a way across country at night marching by the compass or by the stars making a watch serve as a compass military map reading which is not as simple a matter as might be supposed and of making sketches in conventional military signs of areas of ground natural defensive positions and all points likely to be of interest and advantage from a military point of view the work of the signaler has been going on for many years but the training of scouts is a movement which has come about and developed almost entirely during the last twelve years which as the army reckons time is but a very short period it may be anticipated that the practice of scouting and the training of scouts will develop considerably as time goes on needless to say the orderly man is excused all parades during his day of duty as such only in exceptional circumstances are cooks taken for parades and such men as the regimental shoemaker the armorer and his assistants and other men employed at various capacities attend the regular duty parades very seldom on field days occasionally and also on certain commanding officers drill parades the orders of the day announce that the battalion will parade as strong as possible 
this means a general sweep up and turning out of men employed in various ways and excused from parade as a rule and their unhandiness owing to lack of practice sometimes results in their being relieved from their posts and returned to duty while frequently it involves their doing extra drills in addition to their regular work the duty man affects to despise the man on the staff but this affectation is more often a cloak for envy staff jobs as the various forms of employment in a unit are called generally mean extra pay in nineteen cases out of twenty they mean exemption from most ordinary parades and from a good deal of the ordinary routine work of the unit concerned in almost all cases they mean total exemption from fatigues under these circumstances it is not to be wondered at that the secret ambition of the average infantryman at duty when he has relinquished all hope of promotion is to get on the staff End of chapter four chapter five of the british army from within by e charles vivian this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five cavalry practically any man of the twenty eight cavalry regiments of the line will announce with pride that he belongs to the right of the line by this claim is meant that if the british army were formed up in line the regiment for which the claim is made will be on the right of all the rest as a matter of fact this claim on the part of the cavalrymen is incorrect for when the royal horse artillery parade with their guns they take precedence of all other units except the household cavalry british cavalry is divided normally into three regiments of household cavalry and twenty-eight cavalry regiments of the line these latter are subdivided into seven regiments of dragoon guards three of dragoons and eighteen regiments of lancers and hussars theoretically lancers take precedence over hussars but in actual practice the two classes of cavalry are about equal dragoon guards and dragoons rank as heavy cavalry lancers are supposed to be of medium weight and hussars light cavalry in reality dragoon guards and dragoons are slightly heavier than other corps except the household cavalry who are heaviest of all but lancers and hussars are of about equal weight both as regard horses and men the possession of a horse and the duties involved thereby render the work of a cavalryman vastly different from that of an infantryman in the matter of guard duties for instance it would be possible in time of peace to abolish all infantry guard duties without affecting the well-being of the units concerned in cavalry regiments on the other hand it is absolutely necessary that a certain number of men should be placed on night guard over the stables since horses are capable of doing themselves a good deal of harm in the course of a night if left to themselves this is only one instance of the difference between cavalry and infantry but it must be apparent to the most superficial observer that a vast difference exists between the two arms of the service cavalrymen affect to despise the infantry whom they term foot sloggers and beetle crushers while various other uncomplimentary epithets are also applied at times to the men who walk while the cavalry ride each section of the cavalry has its own particular prides and prejudices the household cavalry for instance consider themselves entitled to look down on the regiments of the line line cavalrymen conversely affect to despise the men of the household brigade who they say count it a hardship to go to windsor and never get nearer to foreign service than aldershot further a dragoon guard considers himself immensely superior to a mere dragoon both look down a long way down on the thought of service in the lancers and all three affect to despise the idea of serving as hussars in the meantime the hussars declare that dragoons are big heavy and useless while lancers are not much better and the hussar is the only perfect cavalryman all this however is a matter of good-humoured chaff and in reality dragoons and lancers or dragoons and hussars or any two regiments belonging to different branches of the cavalry when placed side by side in the same station respect each other's qualities without undue regard to their particular designations among the many little legends and traditions of the cavalry that attach to the carabineers six dragoon guards is as interesting as any though not a particularly creditable one 
it is alleged that some time during the peninsular campaign this regiment misbehaved itself in some way and the sentence passed on it was to the effect that officers and men alike should no longer wear the red tunic common to dragoon and dragoon guard regiments thenceforth a blue tunic is substituted for the more brilliant red and in addition a mocking tune was substituted for the ordinary cavalry reveille while the band was ordered to play before reveille each morning possibly the band was guilty of exceptionally bad behaviour in order to merit this extra special punishment in any case the blue tunic the reveille and the band playing have persisted unto this day and even yet it is unsafe to inquire too closely of a carabineer into the reason of his wearing a blue tunic while all others of his kind wear red although the regiment elected to retain the blue tunic when a further change of colour was proposed another tradition is that of the eleventh hussars who on one historical occasion were supposed to have covered themselves in gore and glory to such an extent that the original colour of their uniforms and especially that of their riding breeches was no longer visible for this meritorious feat which is more or less authentic the regiment was granted the privilege of wearing cherry-coloured riding breeches and overalls and this privilege like the carabineer's blue jacket still survives it is hardly necessary to add that the cherry-picker as the eleventh hussar names himself is considerably prouder of his cherry-coloured pants than is the carabineer of his jacket a different explanation of the colour is that it was adopted in honour of the prince consort and since the regiment still retains as its title the prince consort's own the latter is more probably correct from the beginning to the end of his service the cavalryman never gets quite clear of riding school riding school work forms the chief portion of his training as a recruit when he is taught to ride both with and without stirrups to take jumps with folded arms to vault on to a horse's back and in brief to do all that can be done with a horse supposing him to be an average horseman he comes back to riding school annually at least to refresh his memory with the old riding school lessons while if he is a really good horseman he is set to training remounts in the course of which he has to train practically unbroken horses to do their part in the work which he himself has learned on the back of a horse already trained the best riders of all in a regiment are singled out as rough riders or riding school instructors and their duty is to take charge of rides or remounts to instruct men and horses too and to pay particular attention to the breaking in of especially unmanageable young horses the riding school training adopted in the british cavalry is based on the system inaugurated by Boucher, the famous french riding master who came over to england and revolutionized all ideas with regard to horse mastership in the early part of the nineteenth century under this system a horse is taught to obey pressure of leg and rein to the fullest possible extent and the bit mouthpiece forms only a part of the rider's means of control by this means the horse is saved a good deal of unnecessary exertion which is an important thing as far as cavalry riding is concerned since the object of the cavalryman on active service is to save his horse as far as possible against the need for speed or effective striking power following on the work of the riding school the cavalryman is taught on the drill ground to ride in line of troop at close order theoretically the interval between men is six inches from knee to knee but in practice the knees of the men are touching when a troop of men can keep the line perfectly at a gallop a squadron line is formed the culminating point of cavalry training is perfection of line in the charge of which the rate of progression is the fastest pace of the slowest horse a charge produces its greatest effect when the men ride close together and keep in line the object being to effect a definite shock by throwing as much weight as possible against a given point at as great a pace as possible the impact of the charge in theory carries the men who make it through and beyond the enemy against whom they have charged when they are expected to break up their formation and reform facing in the direction from whence they have come the training which a man has to undergo in order to fit him for participating in these shock tactics is necessarily long and severe in addition to this 
cavalry training is directed toward a multiplicity of ends in any military action infantry have their definite place which involves bearing the full brunt of attack maintaining the defensive or in exceptional circumstances assuming the offensive and charging with the bayonet cavalry however very rarely bear the full brunt of a sustained attack as their organization and equipment render them unfit for prolonged defensive operations they are used generally on the flanks of a field force for making flank attacks and pursuing retreating enemies they are also used in small bodies known as patrols as the eyes and ears of an army preceding other arms of the service in the advance they spy out and bring back information of the position and strength of the enemy avoiding actual contact as far as possible work of this kind calls for such initiative and self-reliance on the part of the rank and file as infantrymen are seldom called on to exercise further all cavalrymen are expected to be as proficient in the use of the rifle as are infantrymen while they have also to learn the use of the sword and lancers still carry and use the lance which carried by a certain proportion of the men in the ranks of the dragoon guards and dragoons at the end of the last and beginning of the present century is no longer used by them it will be seen from the foregoing that a properly trained cavalryman must be a thoroughly intelligent individual and must be capable of greater initiative and possessed of more resource than his brother on foot in many directions also he is required to exercise more initiative than the artilleryman who is always protected by an escort either of cavalry or infantry and is called on to think for himself and work the gun himself only when all his officers and non-commissioned officers have been shot to stillness at first sight it would appear that the lancer has an immense advantage over the man armed only with a sword but in actual practice the man with the sword is slightly better off the lancer gets one effective thrust but if this is parried or misses its object the man with the sword can get in two or three thrusts before the lancer has the chance for another blow thus dragoons and dragoon guards lose little by the absence of the lance since they in common with all other cavalry regiments still carry the sword the american army by the way is the only one so far which has tried the experiment of arming the rank and file of its mounted units with revolvers or pistols in the british army revolvers are carried only by sergeants and those of higher rank and the rank and file trust to cold steel for mounted work reserving the rifles which they carry for use on foot the bane of the cavalryman's life in his own opinion is stables where he spends about four hours each day in grooming cleaning sweeping out taking out bedding and bringing it in and various other duties grooming in a cavalry regiment is a meticulous business the writer has personal knowledge of and acquaintance with a troop officer who used to make his morning inspection of the troop horses with white kid gloves on and the horses were supposed to be groomed to such a state of cleanliness that when the officer rubbed the skin the wrong way his gloves remained unsoiled such a state of perfection as this of course is possible only in barracks and it is hardly necessary to say that the officer in question was not exactly idolized by his men like most youths fresh from sandhurst he was incapable of making allowances on manoeuvres and under canvas generally grooming is not expected to be carried to such a fine point as this on active service it frequently happens that there is no time at all for grooming but the general rule is to keep the horses in such a state of cleanliness as will avert disease and assist in keeping the animals in condition during the south african war it was found that gray and white horses were dangerously conspicuous and animals of this color were consequently painted khaki it is not many years since a proposal was made that the second dragoons known in the service as the scots greys from the nationality of the men and the color of the horses should have their gray horses taken from them and darker colored animals substituted from the time of the founding of this regiment its men have been proud of their greys and the order necessitating their disappearance caused a certain amount of outcry in spite of the fact that modern military conditions rendered the substitution desirable 
regimental traditions die hard and the scots greys elected to remain greys in reality while they will retain their name as long as the regiment exists the cavalryman far more than the infantryman makes a point of wearing posh clothing on every possible occasion posh being a term used to designate superior clothing or articles of attire other than those issued by and strictly conforming to the regulations for walking out in town a business commonly known as square pushing the cavalryman who fancies himself will be found in superfine cloth overalls wearing nickel spurs instead of the regulation steel pair and with light thin-soled boots instead of the wellingtons with which he is issued it is a commonplace among the infantry that a cavalryman spends half his pay and more on posh clothing but probably the accusation is a little unjust there is in the cavalry a greater percentage of gentlemen rankers than in any other branch of the service and there are more queer histories attaching to men in cavalry regiments than in units of the other arms the gentleman ranker usually shakes down to a level with the rest of the regiment it has never yet come within the writer's knowledge that any officer accorded to a gentleman ranker different treatment from that enjoyed by the majority of the men in spite of the assertions of melodrama writers on the subject favoritism in the cavalry as in any branch of the service is fatal to discipline and is not indulged in to any great extent certainly not to the benefit of gentlemen rankers as a whole work and efficiency stand first social position in civilian life counts for nothing and the gentleman ranker who joins the service with a view to a commission must prove himself fitted to hold it from a military point of view the gentleman ranker is frequently a remittance man and in that case he is certain of many friends for the frequenters of the canteen are usually short of money a day or two before payday comes round and thus the man with a well-lined pocket is of material use to them disinterested friendships however are too common in the army to call for comment and many and many a case occurs of one cavalryman quick at his work helping another at cleaning saddlery or equipment after he has finished his own without thought or hope of reward the mention of saddlery takes us back to stables where the cavalryman goes far too often for his own peace of mind although as a matter of fact the three stable parades per day which he has to undergo are absolutely necessary for the well-being of the horses the really smart cavalryman is conspicuous not only for keeping his horse in exceptionally good condition but also for the way in which he keeps the leather and steelwork of his saddle and headdress regulations enact that all steel work in the stables shall be kept free from rust and slightly oiled and leather work shall be cleaned and kept in condition with soft soap and dubbin only this regulation however is honoured in the breach rather than in the observance for by the use of brick dust followed by the application of a steel link burnisher steel work is given the appearance of brilliantly polished silver and various patent compositions are used on leather to give it a glossy surface this latter with very little regard for the preservation of the leather all this means a lot of extra work in the stable for the cavalryman it is induced in the first place by one man desiring to give his outfit a better appearance than the rest the squadron officer approves of the polish and brilliance or perhaps the troop officer is responsible and as a result all the men take up what is merely extra work with no real resulting advantage in some extra smart units the men are even required by their superiors to scrub the stable wheelbarrows and burnish the forks used for turning over the bedding but this it must be confessed is not a general practice at the same time the fetish of polish and burnish is worshipped far too well in cavalry units with the occasional result that efficiency takes second place in time of peace to mere surface smartness as has already been stated in a different connection the barrack-room life of the cavalryman is easier than that of the infantryman kit inspections and arms inspections take place at stated intervals and barracks rooms are kept clean though not kept with such fussy exactness as in infantry units the trained cavalryman in normal time finishes the main part of his work at midday he then has his dinner 
and after this makes down his bed as it will be for the night unless it is his turn for fatigue he generally snoozes through the afternoon until about half past four when it is time to get ready for stable parade in india especially a cavalryman has a light time of it for there is allotted to each squadron a definite number of syces or native grooms who assist the men as well as the non-commissioned officers in the care of their horses and who do a good deal of the necessary saddle cleaning cavalry serving in egypt also get a certain amount of assistance in their work and on the whole a cavalryman is far better off on foreign service than he is in home station the advantages of the home station consist mainly in the presence of congenial society among the civilians of the station the soldier abroad is a being apart and for the most part civilians leave him very much alone there remains however the ever-present football by way of consolation as in infantry units bodies of signalers and scouts are necessary to the establishment of every cavalry regiment signalers for the period of their training are excused from all duties connected with horses and stable work cavalry scouts on the other hand have to use their horses in the course of their training and thus attend stables like the rest of the men although stable discipline in their case is somewhat relaxed the cavalry scout requires more training than the infantry scout with his horse he is able to go farther afield and his work is more definitely that of reconnaissance and the obtaining of information which may be of more use to a brigade or divisional commander than that any infantryman is capable of obtaining without a horse to carry him to his other accomplishments the cavalryman is expected to add some slight knowledge of veterinary matters in order that when forced to depend on himself and his horse he can find remedies for simple ailments and keep the horse in a state of fitness the shoeing smith and farriers who form a special department of every cavalry regiment are under the control of the veterinary officer included in the establishment of each cavalry unit and the veterinary officer constitutes the final court of appeal when anything affecting a long-faced chum is in question sufficient has been said about the cavalryman on duty to show that his tasks are legion his fitness to perform them has been attested on recent battlefields as well as on earlier historic occasions off duty and in time of peace he is in the main a fairly pleasant fellow often a very shy one and usually capable of using the king's english in reasonable fashion the average cavalryman has a sufficiency of aspirates and in the matter of intelligence the nature of the duties he is called upon to perform voices his claims quite sufficiently End of chapter 5